at some point I want to present this to the ARCOS board because I think it would be really interesting for them to hear. Um, and in the meantime, I thought I may practice on all of you. Um, I'm guessing it's a projector that's off register, not my laptop. The, just to give you a little bit of background as to what uh, I was involved in the last year, um, myself and two fellow graduate students, uh, one of them, uh, Christopher Shing, who is a master's student uh, in the uh, electrical and chemical engineering department, uh, and uh, Louis Gutierrez, who is uh, one of more of these students in computer science, um, and myself all decided, uh, and I'm from the Science and Technology Studies Department of the Humanities and Social Science um, program here at OPI. The three of us all had a mutual interest in developing a system that would allow for uh, low cost and expensive environmental monitoring that you could use for educational groups, uh, school groups, uh, all the way up through sort of early college level to be able to talk about things like environmental monitoring, to be able to talk about what kind of data feeds into more sophisticated projects. Um, also to potentially, as it evolved, be used in actual monitoring activities if it were to go that far. Um, and what we did in the process of this is we came up with a statement of work, and I'm, I'm guessing that most of you are somewhat familiar with how projects get developed. So um, if you ever end up out in the business world um, and you end up contracting out with other companies to be able to do work for you, the first thing you do is you decide what exactly needs to be developed by that company, and you develop a statement of work which outlines you know, what the purpose is, what everybody's roles are going to be, what the end goal is, what the time, you know, Gantt chart of what the time schedule is going to be, what sort of technology should be used, what sort of licensing should be considered in the process, who owns what when you're done. And we spent uh, maybe a month drafting this thing and ended up coming out to maybe 40 pages by the time we were done. And the reason why we developed it was for our own purposes, but also because we had um, been given the gift of working with the MDL lab here for uh, their spring semester. And how many of you are familiar with the MDL lab? Nobody. Okay, great. Well, this is an educational opportunity on multiple levels. Um, the MDL lab is uh, a lab in, um, uh, over here in the engineering building next door. And their job is to take engineering seniors who need to complete their capstone project and they pull them into groups of anywhere from six to a dozen students, uh, organized by what their interests are. And the MDL lab contracts out to companies like Lockheed Martin and GE and Boeing, et cetera, et cetera. And they show up with a particular technology problem that needs to be resolved. And then they give the MDL lab like 40,000 bucks and then sets the kids off for the semester trying to figure out what this is. And of course, the whole process is overseen by mentors in the lab who are uh, meant to guide them through how you actually accomplish an engineering project like this and keep it on budget and keep it on schedule and, and actually you know, not get lost in the weeds. And um, we were given a gift of the fact that we got it for free, which is you know, wonderful for us. And they ended up, you know, like most student projects, succeeding on 80% of it and then failing on 20% of it, um, which is about average. And we ended up having to sort of the pieces and figure out what needed to be completed to get the device working. But the thing I'm here to present to you today is on the fact that there ended up being a major dispute towards the end of the project as to what the licensing was um, and who owned the technology. And uh, you'll see that this problem ended up snaking its way all over campus to a variety of offices before it got resolved. Now, I just want to sort of show you some of the text from, um, okay, I didn't cut up too many, uh, from the statement of work. And you know, the statement of work that we came up with said explicitly that we were looking to use common-based peer production methods that had um, sort of a hybrid of open source technologies and proprietary technologies as needed. So for example, um, um, the design that we sort of set them off on was like, well, look at Arduino. How, how many of you are familiar with Arduino microprocessors? Okay, Arduino is an open source hardware that you can use for you know, working with sensors and you know, running motors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sort of came out of the model of microcontrollers that could be used at MIT for robotics classes. Now, we said, look at that model and look at the technology that they use. You know, most of what they use is in the open source community, but they may also use like a GPS unit to be able to do detection of location, but that GPS unit is proprietary. It's not an open source GPS piece of hardware, so you can see how that's a good model to use. And so, essentially, we said that this was kind of a uh, an assembly project, it's a collection project in which we're hoping that you'll be able to help us identify and coalesce a lot of technologies that are on the market. And then of course MDL at some point will have to do some of their own design, like a board for example, or a certain software to be able to get it to all you know, come together. 
And this was the rough model that we did here, and you can see how we had we wanted to use sensors and we wanted to use some sort of hybrid approach. So this was the document that we handed the MDL lab. And in most, you know, in most industry contexts, the statement of work is the binding contract of the project. And what they did was they then took this and reinterpreted it for their own needs to be able to sort of simplify it and figure out what their tasks were. And they gave that back to us and we signed off on it, and everybody signed off on it, and we were on our way, right? Well, the way that the MDL works is, um, and I just wanted to show you a couple of the just sort of quick bullet points, um, was that, you know, this sort of reiterates what I was talking about, what the MDL role would be, what sort of hardware and software we would use, and that it would be, you know, built on available open source technology, some special purpose utilities would be developed in partnership with the MDL team. Um, and so once we all agreed upon this, they got started. Now, this was the final poster that they presented to us at the end of the semester, which, you know, they have to do the big final presentation and demonstrate the technology. And the thing I just want to point out on this poster um, that they presented to us is that their, pr their main purpose here is develop an open source environmental sensor for data logging situations. Now, it's really important to realize that the team of 12 students had it in their mind that we're developing something open source, but as we move forward, you realize that they didn't really know what open source was, and there was a big mix of understanding as to what it implied. Now, the thing that you need to understand about the way that the MDL lab works is that not only are they trying to teach the students how to be good engineers, but they're also trying to teach them what it means to operate in the business model of the typical engineering world. And, you know, the reality is that 99.9% .9 of the engineering world is out to make a profit. They're not working for altruistic causes necessarily, and that also means that they develop things. They want copyright protection, they want IP protection, because that's how they make their money, right? Um, open source and Creative Commons is something that is very new just in the last couple of years. It's landed in industry as well as here on campus. And you know, the fact that we have a Rensselaer Center for Open Source, which is a you know a multi-million dollar endowed research center, in an institution that is otherwise built on this sort of like neoliberalist model of like we're going to go off and shut on engineers that go work and like produce money for corporations, is a very interesting little situation which we're going to discover more about. So. Um, what I tried to do here is track through the series of events. Um, the way that the MDL team works is they have an online board that they use to communicate through all the members of the team. Um, myself and the other leaders of the group were able to, you know, sort of keep tabs on what their activities were, myself and the other two graduate students, that is. And as this licensing issue started to unfold into something that was become problematic, I started to document it as much as, as possible because that's what a good social scientist does, right? Um, and so what I did in, in these sort of, um, you know, continuations is I did my best to keep it anonymous by blocking out the various student names. But you'll see as we start moving to some of the administrators that got involved, I left their names because it's important to know where the messages are coming from on campus. So um, the whole conversation started when they laid out the board for me. And, um, and I went and I, you know, we, I took a look at it and they said, this is what we're going to be sending off to print. And I noticed that down at the corner it said, you know, um, this is a, an older version of the image, but it said, um, Copyright MDL lab, all rights reserved. Um, you know, patent pending RPI. And I said that's not the correct language. Like this is an open source project. And, and I instructed them. I sat down with them, and they changed the wording. And I said this is what should go out to press. And I put, um, you know, what I instructed them to do was this, which is a Creative Commons um, attribution, non-commercial share alike, instead. And we put the logos on everything else. And I said go ahead and get the approval of your team leaders, which um, are Mark Anderson and Januti Chennai, uh, both of which are, are really wonderful fellows. And so I, one thing I want to stress here is that the individuals that I'm mentioning, um, it's, not, it's not a matter of animosity at all. It became an educational process for all of us in terms of how you actually negotiate these things. Um, and so I said, go ahead and, and clear this with Mark and Janucci and see, you know, make sure that they're OK with it, and then we can send it off to print. So you can see as they have the meeting notes through the course of the weeks, um, it says, you know, Mark and Janice are dealing with the open source licensing issue, they'll deal with it, we don't have to worry about it. And so I was like, okay, great. Well, they had the conversation, we're on a roll. Well, um, we start to come through and we'll see in 421, they have another meeting in which says, you know, we're not gonna worry about the licensing, Mark's gonna handle it. And I'm like, okay, so you can see this and kind of get, getting pushed off. And part of it came from a conversation that I had with Mark and Janice at one point. I was like, well, so when are we going to resolve this licensing issue? And they said, well, you know, this could be a deal breaker. You're like, we've never done anything like this before. It's always copyright MDL lab. And I was like, well, yeah, it's going to be a deal breaker because the entire statement of work says that this is supposed to be open source. Um, and so then it all kind of sat and I figured that it would get dealt with, right? Well, um, 
couple of days later, um, I see posted on the Redmine site that they decided that this was the language that was going to go on the board, and that was the final decision of the lab. And so the students ended up, you know, following the tone, saying, "Okay, well, we changed all the language." And so you can see here, copyright 2011, Design Lab permission is granted to use this software for educational purposes only. All other rights reserved. And I said, "Well, you know, that's." So I had to sit down and I said, "Have you ever heard of Creative Commons?" And they're like, "No." And I said, "Have you ever heard of Lawrence Lessig?" And they said, "No." I'm like, "Have you ever heard of Richard Stallman?" And they're like, "Yeah." What's that computer science guy at MIT, right? And I said, "But what was he doing?" And I was like, "Have you ever heard of GNU licensing?" And they're like, "Not really." And I said, "Well." How exactly, what's my base for being able to describe the problem here if they don't know any of these names, right? Um, and I, I tried to explain to them that, that, you know, a Creative Commons license, an open source license or a GNU license is not the same as the Circle C. Because with the Circle C, you have, you know, it's all rights reserved with the exception of these few that we're allotting. And when you end up saying for educational purposes only, all of the rights reserved, that's something different in open source because in the open source community, you're allowing other people to modify your technology, and as long as it continues the ethos of what your design was, then they can continue to change it and modify it and add to it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not allowed in this project. And one of the things that we said was that we wanted to design something in which we hand it off to a community, but then they're free to do what the hell they want with it as long as they're not making money off of it. That was the stipulation. And I was like, you know, this isn't the same thing. And so it kind of, it sat out there as this kind of like point of contention for some time. Um, and so then at some point we're like, well, we need to resolve this thing because we only have a couple of weeks left of the semester and they're about to pound out this board and we need to make sure we resolve the issue before everybody takes off for the semester, right? So we started going up the chain of command through campus. <clears throat> First place we went to was the office, uh, uh, the research administration, which sent us to the Office of Technology Commercialization. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is on campus, they are the office that deals with all intellectual property on campus. They are the ones that any time an invention or a patent or anything is developed in the labs here, they take it, they figure out what the fair value is of it, they license it, they make money on it, they sell it off to a company or whatever, and then they figure out how much to get kicked back to the lab they actually develop. It. That's their role. Every campus that does any kind of research has an office like this. Um, and so it set off uh, Ron Kudlow, who's the director of this, and, and we're sort of waiting and waiting to find out what to happen with this. In the meantime, we also talked to the Office of Entrepreneurship, which is another office on campus here that sort of promotes this idea of, of small projects and students going off and doing research on their own, um, who believed, based on industry standards, that our statement of work should have been a binding agreement. One of the things that came out of our conversations with the MDL lab was, well, you know, the statement of work was just a document. It's not a binding contract. And we said, well, if that's not the binding contract, then what is? Because nothing else that we gave you stated what the purpose of the project was. Then we ended up going to the graduate dean who said, well, you know, if worse comes to worse, I could say that by them saying that copyright is going to be placed on this thing, it's impeding the research of the graduate students. And that came out of a conversation between Chris and Lewis and I who all said, well, if this project isn't open source, then we're done. We're just dropping. We're not going to execute it. We're not going to deploy it. Um, and we're all pretty committed to that philosophy. And so we said, you know, if you put the copyright on it, you might as well just throw it in the trash. And so, you know, it sat out there again for a couple of days. 